Welcome to The Art of Modern Ops, a podcast series on modernizing cloud infrastructure. Hosted by Cornelia Davis, WeWork CTO and author of the book Cloud Native Patterns. GitOps Days 2020 is a two day virtual event which kicks off on May the 20th, featuring a stellar lineup of speakers covering all things GitOps. You don't want to miss out. Visit GitOpsDays.com to learn more. Hello, and welcome back to our podcast. Today, joining me, I have Chris Short, who is Technical Marketing Manager, Cloud Platforms at Red Hat. He's a blogger and also the creator and editor of the OSS focused newsletter, DevOpsish. Say that five times fast. Welcome to the show, Chris. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, would you please add to my brief introduction and tell you, tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and your background and what you what interests you these days? Sure. So I'm Chris Short. I am uh, working at Red Hat these days. I work uh, mainly with OpenShift, which is Red Hat's uh, Kubernetes platform. Uh, take Kubernetes, uh, add a bunch of enterprise you know needed features. And you will have OpenShift, uh, we, you know, developed in the open source way that we do at Red Hat. Um, on top of that, I run, like you mentioned, the newsletter uh, DevOpsish. So a lot of reading is involved in the cloud native DevOps and open source arenas. Um, and then on top of that, I am also a disabled veteran. So I also advocate for uh, other disabled veterans and people with uh, mental health needs such as PTSD, anxiety, depression, et cetera. So yeah, that's kind of me in a nutshell right now. And, uh, you know, super excited working on all the things Kubernetes in the community as well. Oh, Chris, thank you so much for your service and even even more so for the advocacy that you have for your uh, your fellows in that space. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so what I, what I thought we could talk about today was kind of this very general thing about organizations who want to get better at software. There's all sorts of stuff that's been, been written at, about how you get better at software and they use more technical and more sophisticated words than that. But what it really boils down to is that we want to get better at doing software. We want to get better at building it, releasing it, having more resilient systems and all of those things. And that one of the, the, the big things, um, one of the big categories that uses some more of those sophisticated words that I'm not using right now is DevOps. That's one of the things that we're applying to make some progress on that. So you do a, a great deal in the DevOps arena. Um, so maybe we could start out by, can you give us a definition of DevOps? E Yes, I've actually written a definition of DevOps because uh, originally it was undefined and intentionally so. Um, and I've written a definition just to give it some more color in general and kind of, you know, put some kind of pin in the topic of DevOps. But it's a, in my opinion, it's a professional practice of frequent, continued and iterative improvements. Uh, you have to measure these improvements. The goal of those uh, improvements should be to become a high velocity organization and improving your business outcomes. Um, with that being said, Right. Like in that definition, I didn't mention software or I didn't mention ops or dev or anything. Right. So the idea is, in my opinion, is that DevOps, much like medicine or anything else, is a practice. And to to get good at things, you have to practice them. So if you practice delivering software and you measure delivering that software and you add a, I don't know, a scientific methodology, for lack of a better term, to uh, maintain uh, metrics as far as changes in what you're doing with your software to changes in your business performance and keeping those, you know, highly measured and entangled, um, you know, improvements in business performance based off what happened in the infrastructure kind of scenario, uh, you will find that you'll have improvement when you are measuring things in line as far as we made this change with this out come expected and this is what we got as a result. Um, so it's it's using uh, data to drive decisions, which is something we all like to do. It's, it's a culture of change, frequent change, and it's also a professional practice. Um, so those are the three high level things about DevOps. When you start getting down into the weeds of it, you start noticing that that lack of a definition kind of 
makes things super fun sometimes because you could have a tool or a, a process or anything called DevOps. Yeah. Now, as you're describing that, one of the things that springs to mind for me is DORA. Mm. So the DevOps Research Assessment uh, Group, yes. um, founded by Nicole Forsgren, Jez Humble, Gene Kim. Um, and they talk about, you know, of course, Nicole is a data scientist at, at heart, really. Um, and so these things around measuring and iterative and scientific, I have spoken with Nicole several times, and she is constantly pointing out that this is all about the science of DevOps. So you're lending support to this idea that there's a science to DevOps as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Nicole is, I'm a big fan of Nicole's. I'm a big fan of her work. Uh, as far as Accelerate, the book specifically, I actually recommend everybody uh, reads Accelerate because they'll get a better idea of improving, you know, software quality inside their organization and the, the, the how to, right. Um, Accelerate goes into, these are the numbers we got based off survey data and, you know, here's what we see working and, you know, reading that book, or I actually listen to it on audio tape, however you want to consume it. Um, it can really open your eyes in the same, a, a lot in the same way that the Phoenix project kind of opens a lot of people's eyes when they read that book. So the, the, the idea of adding data and science into anything I think is good, but when you can do it with something as human driven as software development, it, it really adds a layer of, um, you know, dimming to the, to the works where it's, you know, you can quantitatively say like, this is going to improve someone, someone's pride in their work, thus improving the quality of it. That I think is what, what really makes, uh, business types like, latch on to the idea of DevOps. Yeah. Now, everything, the way that you describe it, I mean, by the way, I think that's a fantastic description. It's the best one I've ever heard. Um, you make it sound so tractable and there's been books written on it and Dora has published the State of the DevOps Report and Gene Kim runs the DevOps Enterprise Summit. So there's an ample amount of work going on in the space. So What's hard about it if it's if if there's so much being written about it? What's what remains that's hard? So there's so much being written about it because the hardest part is the thing that we have the least control over, right? Like we can always we can always buy tools, we can always instantiate processes, we can always you know add a you know a, a nice foosball table to the the break room or whatever, but we can't change the culture of organizations uh, quite as easily. And DevOps requires you to change kind of systemically the way you look at IT is, you know, a, it's no longer a cost center. It is now, uh, you know, a, a tool that you can leverage to increase uh, business outcomes and increase business performance. So that mind shift itself is you know, industry-wide kind of happening to an extent, just in general, but the actual idea of embracing change and applying change in ways that you can manage it and ways that benefit you is very much something that is hard for people to just understand in general, because for years we've been told to go slow, take our time, be methodical, you know, speed kills, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, it's the, it's the, 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 it's the antithesis of all those ideas put together that, that kind of defines DevOps. And, you know, it's, it's not a rebellious culture in any way, shape or form, but it's, it's rebellious in the way it approaches IT delivery or as far as, you know, just services coming on board, right? Like they're going to get there faster. They're going to get there with more people being happy with the outcomes uh, if you keep working on it in a way that, you know, works for your business. Yeah, I, I get you there. So the, the mind, the mindset changes, you know, and you have described the antithesis. Um, one of the things that I've sometimes suggested to customers when I talk to them is that in fact, I do want them to experiment in production and that usually results in kind of an audible gasp in the room. Like, what do you mean experiment in production? That's the anti and, and, to, and, and the opposite of what we've been doing. Having trouble with that word today. Yeah. The way my husband sometimes puts it is physics is hard. People are harder. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, Nermal Meta, he, uh, he's like, what well, computers are 
easy. Meat is hard, you know, <laughs> so yeah, like, yeah, the, the human exactly. flesh, the human flesh is a malleable, you know, impressionable thing. And, uh, we make assumptions that are sometimes wrong and we can make mistakes and we do all these things, but like that computer is going to do exactly what you tell it every time. Um, now how computers work together in the way you tell them, that is sometimes a mystery, obviously. Uh, but the, the, the overarching theme is that the hard part is the people. The easy part is the technology. Yeah. Although, you know, I, I have to, um, I, I hear that a lot. And as a technologist, I guess personally, I get a little bit like, okay, technology is not always that easy. So um, I don't disagree that the culture part and the human part is probably harder, but I, I usually like to point out that technology um, is also challenging, but maybe it is more tractable. Mm -hmm. Well, so. think of all the different ways we've had to manage people over the years, right? Like we're in the, the, the human resources genre now, but it wasn't always called human resources. It was called personnel and something before that and something before that. And, you know, even that, right, like managing people inside organization iterates on itself frequently, right? Because of regulatory changes and things like that. Why isn't software in the same way that, you know, something like HR would? You know, and it's not that every piece of software ever created has regulatory requirements, but you have to think, right? Like if managing people needs to change routinely, why wouldn't software? Oh, very interesting. I hadn't thought about that way. Very cool. So speaking of um, HR and managing people, to a large extent, one of the formal um, constructs that has been created in, inside of organizations um, is to, to help with managing people and managing tasks and all of that is the org chart. Mm. It's the organizational structure. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the organizational structure and some of these cultural changes that you're talking about? So the, the org chart like matters not for DevOps, right? Like it's great for reporting and everything else, but you really need to kind of throw that out when it comes to communication and uh, just like teams in general, right? Like you want more communication happening between teams. So you want to remove as many barriers as possible. So, you know, uh, open offices were kind of a before DevOps kind of thing, but we realized very quickly is that these open offices made it very easy to collaborate with people. Uh, so putting them in small groups and letting them work in those small groups and manage themselves you know, with like a, a team lead kind of scenario uh, is usually very good, right? I come, you know, from, a, you know, a long ops world, but in that ops world, I spent a lot of time in government, you know, being in the military and everything. So when, when someone says, yeah, we're going to have this, you know, 30 person team and they're all going to deliver this one thing. I'm like, okay, how is that team divided up internally? Because no way all those 30 people are working with each other at the same time. And Sometimes they are. And that's like, oh, well, that's that's got to be really challenging, right? Like managing communication, one-to-one -one communications across 30 people has to be a nightmare. And often it is. And that's why you have ticketing systems and tracking systems and all this other stuff. But if you took that team of 30 and broke them down into six separate teams and you said, you're all now in charge of six different things, or you all now have, you know, overlapping you know, responsibilities, but also have your own independent responsibilities as well. Wouldn't that make for a stronger organization so long as that 30 person team were covering all their objectives? Yes, right. That is often the answer, right? So when I think of um, large teams of people, I always think about how they're broken down into smaller, you know, organizational units because of my military background. So, yeah, I mean, if I had 30 people with me, it's because I had a very large job to do. Um, it wasn't because it was just a strategic importance, right? Like that's kind of a, you know, a, a need versus a want kind of scenario that exists in a, you know, kind of counterbalance between uh, public and private sector, right? So that's, that's often how I look at it, right? Like if, if you need a team of 50 people to do this one thing for your business, how are you going to make that more iterative? How are you going to make that more consumable for that 50 people to accomplish? And that's what DevOps kind of helps you do. Right. Like you can then take this group of 50 people and say, well, here's all the things that we have to build. And here's where all these skill sets align to them and put them in teams that make sense. 
And that's where you put like the network person with like the C++ dev to figure out this new, you know, interface for your load balancers or something, right? Like, so if, if you want the best success, you have to put all the right people in the room and give them the right kinds of feedback and everything else. You wouldn't go to your customers and say, what do you think of this brand new thing we just built and released and ta-da, right? Like you do a little market research first. You do a little testing to make sure the market's good and okay with your product and prototype or whatever, right? Like you don't just release to the wild first thing and then watch it fail, right? <laughs> but we so often see that happen in software. And it's, it's really just taking this thing that we've been doing for so long called business and applying it to software. It's, it's not too horribly complex and, and doing that with an org chart, you can't, you, you don't do business with an org chart. You, you manage other things with an org chart, right? Like you might manage the reporting structure within a business, but you don't actually manage the business outcome with the org chart. Yeah, that's really interesting. And that is, again, the opposite of what we have been doing for several decades, mm -hmm. because the org chart actually established the centers of competency mm -hmm. in certain areas, or so we thought, you know, so we had the, you know, the business analysts, and then we had the architects, and then we had the development team, but the development team was broken up in some weird way that was convenient for the, you know, maybe financial spreadsheets, right. but in yeah. the end, yeah, in the, didn't, it, that, yeah, it's, mm. You're, you're hitting a fantastic point in the sense of, uh, and I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but the, 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 the mainframe or the financial system, you know, has some limitation where this person needs this, da, 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 right? Like just because it worked out on paper doesn't mean you have to, you know, enforce that throughout your entire software development practice, right? That, that, that just makes no sense, right? Like, and I see that happen so frequently. Yeah. And, and what you're making me think about it as well is that you cited this example of, you know, the, the, C, the C developer and the networking person putting them together to solve a particular problem that's very context dependent. And what we've had in the past was these organizational structures that kind of assumed a whole bunch of stuff and then challenging those assumptions, being more adaptable to the problem at hand today mm -hmm. was something that wasn't built into the system. Right. Yeah. Do more with less is what we like to tell people often. Um, but like do more without the expectation of you ever having done it uh, is what we so often see. Right. So the, the thing that keeps happening or keeps coming up is these new technologies form Kubernetes. Now all of a sudden we need all these people to run Kubernetes. Where do we find these people? Right. So we have this, you know, problem where, we want people to have, uh, you know, to have the skill to, you know, know the market and understand what the market needs. But, you know, we have no capability to really dictate what's going to happen in the market. Because if you would have told people five years ago, Kubernetes was going to be the biggest thing in containers, they would have told you, no, Docker is. So the, 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 the changes that happen so quickly, you know, mandate this kind of cohesive working environment. Yeah. Okay, so you just made me think of something else. It's not unusual for us to find in a large organization the DevOps team. Oh, yeah. Or the director of DevOps. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about that? How do you feel about that? Well, I was a manager of DevOps at one point in time, and that was fine because I think the problem that our organization had is that we needed to create multiple like DevOps organizations underneath it because we had so many products that somebody had to start spearheading that effort of saying, this is how to do X, Y, and Z. And then making that consumable in a handoff kind of way, right? Like we've done this for you the first time. You can now do this yourself as many times as you want and you can iterate on it this way with safe, you know, guards in place kind of thing. So that I think is effective, it, it, you know, calling it the team versus the center of excellence or, you know, uh, you know, community of practice, I think is much better term, right? But uh, the, the community of practice term doesn't work well as like a, you know, organizational unit <laughs> in an org chart. So we call it a team and we kind of realize that like, oh yeah, it's a practice and we can't, you know, effectively iterate on business outcomes unless we're doing it as a holistic organization, not just one team and one part of one department. Um, so yeah, like being a manager on a DevOps team isn't bad if that DevOps quote team is actually, 
you know, scoped and has been, you know, given the, 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 the capabilities to expand their capabilities, if that makes sense, right? Like to bring in more people into the DevOps mantra. Yeah. So, and you use the word in a handoff way or the phrase in a handoff way, which I really like. So it sounds like you were really just the tip of the spear, if you will, in bringing DevOps into the organization and you helped kind of seed lots and lots of other people with these ideas. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, and to be honest, a lot of it was the developers themselves coming to us and saying, Hey, we need a way to do X. We need a way to do it, you know, multiple times. And we would just say, Oh, well, how about something like X, Y, and Z? And they said, well, that's great. And we would work with them to kind of say, all right, this is what, you know, we can give you as far as, you know, extensibility and safety and everything else. And we think it gets you most of the way there and gives you the capability to get yourself the rest of the way there. Here you go. And that's kind of the thing, right? Like DevOps and standards go hand in hand. You know, people think, oh, it's fast changing and there's lots of stuff happening in the background and, you know, the industry is just moving so quickly. Uh, but DevOps is really about finding standard ways to do things. And then making maintaining them, right? Like not forgetting about them. But yes, this is how we made a hammer today. It might not be the same way we make a hammer a year from now, but that hammer is going to be better as a result. You know, it's not going to have extra bells and whistles on it, but it might be five cents cheaper to make and uh, three ounces lighter. Who knows? Um, but the the idea is you're making improvements and you're you're driving the 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 outcome that you want not the business driving you, if that makes sense. Yep. Yep. I get it. So here's a, a refrain that I sometimes hear. Oh, all this DevOps stuff sounds really great, but it would never work in my highly regulated environment. So talk to me about that. Some of the most, sure. yeah, some of the most uh, regulated environments in the world are embracing DevOps right now. So, uh, you know, the perfect example I can give, I have two like Defense Department examples, right? One is uh, Nicholas Chilean and his team of folks building a platform for application development within the Air Force. Um, and they're using DevOps methodologies, Kubernetes, and, you know, all the bells and whistles and tools and everything else to actually deliver, you know, systems to warfighters using DevOps inside the Air Force. Uh, uh, if you remember the headlines, uh, this is going to be more memorable. Uh, if you remember the headlines a few years ago, the Air Force had all these problems with its nuclear weapons arsenal, right? Like we were losing warheads over the continental U.S. They were stuck on a plane and no one knew they were there. And it's antiquated and old and all this other stuff. Well, 2016, 2017, they put out a call for you know help. And they actually mentioned Agile, DevOps, containers, you know, Jira. Jenkins, the whole nine yards, they called out for like a full DevOps pipeline set up to modernize the nuclear weapons arsenal. So like it's being done in really heavy, heavily regulated environments uh, with really, 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 uh, you know, volatile things. Um, so like the idea of that won't work here anymore is kind of like, it makes me almost giggle and laugh, right? So, you know, like you're an insurance company, right? Like, my insurance company is one of the biggest embracers of Kubernetes, I think, in the insurance industry. So it's like I look at Kubernetes as a tool that kind of enforces DevOps to an extent. But the the idea that like my insurance company and my bank are both doing DevOps type things makes me just laugh whenever I hear someone say that won't work here because it's just it's just it's it's you it's it's resistance to change is all it is it's 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 you having a kind of visceral reaction to well i've been doing this for so long this way why do i have to change kind of thing and that is totally normal for you to have but saying that straight up when there's you know tons of industries and experience every industry has done some kind of transformation within it towards a devops methodology and has worked very successfully and now we're starting to see people that innovate faster digitally are leaving the people that aren't behind. So now it's a priority to start innovating digitally. And this is how people are doing it is using DevOps. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I 
completely agree. Now, I'm going to get to another category of detra detractors, another excuse that people use. Um, we were talking about Nicole and Jez and Jean earlier. Um, and a couple of years ago, I remember being at a conference and Jez and Nicole being up on stage and Jez saying, turns out architecture matters. And there's some work in, you know, some of the, the stuff that that group has done has pointed out that software architectures do matter. So the next set of detractors that we hear from all the time are, well, we can't do DevOps because our um, software system is a monolith. Yeah, there's nothing that, I mean, that has nothing to do with anything, right? Like the, the, the fact you're using a monolith or making changes to a monolith versus microservices. Yeah, I mean, it changes the way you do DevOps, but you can still very well do DevOps, right? Like I worked on a you know, monolithic content management system for a newspaper customer that or newspaper company that was all written in Perl, Perl uh, in the, you know, this was 2010, 2011, 2012. So imagine that monolith or actually it was a stack of monoliths basically <laughs> because it was just like this one service built the web page this one service delivered the web page to this thing but, you know it was just just thing on top of thing on top of thing well you then had this big monolith where if you monkeyed with this one piece this weird thing would happen over here and you would never know i mean it's it's not much different monolith versus microservices you're still doing the same practices right you're still measuring changes you're still making them frequently you're still getting feedback frequently on those changes so you know that the change went out you know that the change has been in place for a while you know that the changes had this kind of results so and then you're also getting customer feedback along with that so that you know your business outcomes are happening as you desire this all comes together to devops it doesn't matter you know what you're working on, just as long as you're practicing those methodologies that enable you to move quickly in the market and enable you to do things faster. What you'll often realize is that you might have to pull a couple of pieces off your monolith and maybe, you know, make them easier to manage. But that large chunk of monolith often remains, even in companies that have spent a lot of time, uh, you know, my, splitting out a bunch of microservices, there's still going to be a core monolith app that kind of sits there and still does its job, right? Like we still have mainframes today, even though banks haven't, you know, invested in DevOps. It's because that mainframe is doing a very good job. And that team has decided if we put an API in front of that mainframe that can do everything we need to do safely, we're good. So yeah, like there's there's a good reason mainframes still exist is because that you can still do DevOps with monoliths and there's plenty of people doing it right now. Yeah, so you touched upon, you said things like frequently um, and, you know, iterative and those types of things. And I also, ironically, have spent time in my, my history working on a monolithic content management system. In my case, it was Documentum. Um, and there is no way that Documentum could have been frequent, frequently released. But then you touched upon, hey, you start to extract things out of the monolith. And so can you say more about how you get that impedance mismatch of, okay, here's something that I'd love to do. I'd love to adopt these DevOps practices and do things more frequently. But because of what you just described a little bit ago, I changed something over here and it has these rippling effects through the entire system that are going to take me three months to track down before I can generate a release. Can you give some concrete examples of how we manage that? Well, sometimes you have to realize there's this thing called sunk cost fallacy, right? I'm not saying throw out everything just because it takes you three months to debug it, but at some point in time, you have to realize, yes, we might've been doing something in a certain way for so long, is that the right way to continue to do it? And if the answer is yes, then you're going to have to spend that time debugging, sadly, right? Like if you need to make a change and it's going to take you three months to figure out how that even works, that's your first problem, <laughs> right? Like step one is figuring out why it takes you three months, right? Or not just, uh, you know, if I make a change, I have to make a whole new release, right? Like how can you do changes that maybe don't require a whole new release, right? Like, do you necessarily need to release an entire whole new version just to change uh, some CSS, right? Like splitting front from back 
in a lot of apps makes a ton of sense. Um, making it so that you're using a framework on the front end, not necessarily uh, like hand-coded HTML and CSS, makes that a little easier too to make smaller changes more easily. Um, you might have to layer in more software into your monolith to make this feasible too. Like that's that's completely possible as well, right? Like the idea of, you know, m making API-driven uh, infrastructure or, you know, API-driven applications within a monolith is entirely feasible, right? The, the, the feature flag movement and um, other uh, ways to make um, big, staunchy, you know, old applications more flexible and manageable have happened. And, you know, what we've seen is that front and back end kind of delineation. We've seen that kind of happen in the market naturally. Uh, but you can also see, right, like functions start, you know, splitting off, right? We've seen this rise of serverless and the idea of, um, you know, not, not even microservices, but like I just have this piece of code that does this one function. Well, you can have an API on your monolith that does that, right? Like all this API does is this one function. You can make that of, you know, a thing that happens and you can then allow your developers to, you know, access that function at any point in time you want. Sometimes it's, you know, simply just making easier access points to things as opposed to uh, re-architecting an entire application, right? And, and that's, that's where the iterative part comes in, right? Like you have to kind of figure out, right? Like, yes, I have this elephant, um, but on the diagram, how do I make this elephant into, you know, I have, you know, 16 sprints this year. How can I change the elephant in 16 sprints or 32 sprints if I'm taking two years, right? Like, you know, which parts of the elephant are you going to touch when is part of the process, right? Yeah. Okay. So architecture matters, but we can get there incrementally. It's not a big bang. Yeah. You're never going to like, when people say, oh yeah, we're embracing DevOps. We're just going to do it all at once. We're just going to replace our entire IT department, right? Like I've been there. I've done that. It doesn't work. Um, when people say that like, yeah, we're just going to go to the cloud, right? And then they say, oh yeah, we're going to re-architect our entire application while we do that. That also doesn't work, right? It's, it's too much at one time. So we often have this problem in, you know, technology of like shiny thing, go use the shiny thing. But we also have the problem of re-architect the thing or rebuild the thing or redo the thing as we're trying to do many other things at once. And that's where we kind of get lost, right? Like we have to stay focused on a workable, manageable series of tasks. And that often requires you to sit there and say, you know, well, I have to measure what my team is capable of before I can even embrace a DevOps transformation because I need to see how fast my team can move iteratively right now. And oftentimes that answer is very slowly. So you have to say, you know, if I need to instantiate a change in my infrastructure, how long does that take now? And then set your expectations accordingly. And then go back from there and make sure you're measuring how long does it take that change this time and the next time and make sure that those metrics are moving in the right direction. Because you need to adjust the way you're trying to dissect your monolith as it is, as you're going. And that's, you know, it's not just, oh, we're doing DevOps and you do it once. You're doing DevOps and you do it continuously. It's not just a one-time shot. Well, I appreciate going off on, on kind of the architectural angle for a moment. I'm going to draw us back to the, the cultural side as well. So, um, you know, you've been talking about some pretty major changes in places, even if you get there incrementally. We talked a little bit about the change in mindset earlier, and you talked about being, um, you know, a part of a DevOps group, which was the tip of the spear um, in your organization. And we also talked a little bit about the detractors. So you're always going to have those detractors. Can you talk a little bit more about how you helped shift those mindsets? Any specific techniques or approaches that you used to um, deal with the inevitable conflict that comes when as you say, change is hard. Yeah. So yeah, change is hard. People embracing change is even harder. The idea of making change the, the regular norm is even harder than that, right? Like I don't say these things without some, you know, uh, recognition of the challenges that are ahead. But the, the biggest like examples that I can give are like, you know, 
concrete numbers around changes that have been made and embracing this kind of philosophy. So you have to find your allies very quickly. People that want to do this inside your organization, you kind of want to team up with them and say, all right, what's a win that we can get very early on that has some measurable impact that we can show to other people? And if you find two or three of these things and you, you, you pull it off, you make the change, you see some, you know, some, some metrics moving in the right direction that you want to see change, uh, you know, and they have to tie to, you know, business goals, obviously. That's how you build the W's up so that you can go to those detractors and say, well, look, you know, we we made this change and this, this, this thing happened and we're doing better now. We made this change and look at this metric that's going up as opposed to, you know, flatline before, right? Or we made, you know, it's, if, if you're used to working with, uh, uh, you know, front end technologies, it's like A-B testing, but for, you know, infrastructure or for back end systems, basically. So you want to show the A versus the B off as much as possible to folks who don't think this is feasible or don't think it's practically, you know, capable. Uh, I, I had to work with a director of IT for a large health system that was strictly, you know, no, no, no cloud, no DevOps, no nothing. And we, we kind of had to like make an end run around the, the ITSM process to just basically say, right, like, we're not saying this is, you know, not working, but we are saying there's better ways to do this, right? So we actually had a, a service that we built and we said we intentionally said we were going to use, you know, Heroku for compute. We were, you know, putting the right IP addresses and all the paperwork and load balancer addresses, all these external services and such. And the, 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 the word from on high was no cloud. And they went ahead and signed off on it all anyway. And we were doing everything in compliance with HIPAA. All the data was anonymized leaving and it was double checked that it was anonymized in the same process, you know, that is, you know, used for uh, anonymizing data in the system already. Um, and all the data was stored locally. So it was literally just computing anonymized data. Like they were bursting to the cloud for compute, which is exactly what the cloud is for. And the ITSM process kind of fell down on its face when they realized everybody was just pencil whipping it and then, the IT director finally relented and said, you know what, you're right, let's go get some cloud and like actually made HIPAA uh, compliant, you know, cloud environments available to the organization. It took some time. There's still a lot of stuff inside the organizational data centers that, you know, could be in the cloud, but they eventually came around, right? The idea of, you know, something working better than what they had envisioned is often hard for people in leadership to like understand. So you kind of have to show them. And sometimes that could be show them a side project that you're working on, but like kind of similar to this other thing that you're working on at work and show them how, you know, you did it this way and it works better. Often, you know, you can start building up those small wins inside your team, inside your, you know, your the right hand half of the org chart or whatever part of the org chart you happen to be in in your organization. And then that kind of spreads throughout. And that's really a good way to start. Um, but what you want to do at some point in time, uh, you want to make sure that, yes, you're showing those wins to your team and your team is happy and everything else, but you need to make sure that those wins are getting escalated a couple levels up that work chart too, to show your leadership that we are doing DevOps and it is kind of working for us. And, you know, maybe you, the rest of the organization should buy into this. And then that's how you really get the ball rolling is get that top leadership buy-in. Yeah. Yeah. And once you get that executive error cover, then... Mm -hmm. You're, you're good to go. Well, Chris, it has been such a delight chatting with you today. I really appreciate your insights and I'm sure our listeners do as well. Um, thank you so much for those insights and for coming on the, on the show. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate all the time today. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Art of Modern Ops with Cornelia Davis. Watch for further episode announcements on the Weaveworks blog or follow us on Twitter at Weaveworks.